the slide that you're now looking at is a slide from a paper by James Hansen, who's one of the arch climate extremists, I think it's probably fair to say, uh, at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. I first came across him when I was giving testimony in front of the state legislature of Kentucky uh, a few years ago. And the Greens got in touch with Hansen and said, what do you think about Moncton giving testimony? And he issued a stinging statement attacking testimony that he hadn't actually seen. So once again, we're dealing with a scientist rather like Professor Abraham himself, who is very willing to give scientific opinions on an unscientific basis. So that is the rather dubious character that the dubious character John Abraham relies upon uh, in his next point. And what he says is that on this graph, just to reinforce how tightly greenhouse gas levels and temperatures are linked, the following data is presented. The red line on the graph, which you see now, is observed temperatures over the last 450,000 years. And the blue line is temperatures calculated by James Han Hansen using a computer model. If your model accounted for the changes in temperature primarily due to greenhouse gases. So what James Hansen, says Professor Abraham, and his co-author said is, let's ignore all other forces on climate and let's just model the climate based on greenhouse gas forcings. And here's what they get you can see that the blue and red are in great agreement with each other and it's extremely strong evidence that CO2, the greenhouse effect, is the biggest contributor to past climate change. Well, that is a breathtakingly astonishing statement if you're a classicist like me and you have been trained in logical thought and you've been trained to evaluate what constitutes evidence and what does not, what constitutes mere misdirection. And Hansen's paper is artful misdirection. It doesn't offer evidence. And what I'm going to do is just to run through some of the logical principles in classical logic, which frankly, in the old days, every scientist would have been familiar with. But Professor Abraham is clearly no more aware of than poor Dr. Hansen was. And in logic, while absence of correlation between two data sets necessarily implies absence of causation, if they don't correlate, then neither of them caused the other. On the other hand, correlation does not necessarily imply causation. I know that's rather a lot to throw at you in what's supposed to be a relatively simple presentation, but it's quite important to understand that merely because two data sets appear to follow each other, as these two on the graph do, that doesn't mean that one of them caused the other. And the reason why it doesn't is that, first of all, you don't know which of the two is the causative one, even if they're correlated at all, even if they are causatively linked. Which of the two caused the other? After all, we know from very careful measurements in the early climate, looking back through the ice cores, that it was always global temperatures that changed first, typically 800 to 2,800 years before CO2 concentration changed, indicating that the primary driver, insofar as these two data sets are correlated, is in fact temperature change and that CO2 change follows the temperature change. Now, of course, it may then, to some extent, amplify the temperature change, but nevertheless, it is very clear that the triggering event, as each interglacial warm period starts and ends, is a change in temperature, which is then lagged by a change in CO2 concentration. Now, call me old-fashioned, but one thing that you don't have to be very good at logic to know is that the later of two events cannot have caused the former. And I accept that there's nothing in the laws of physics that prevents the arrow of time from running in only one direction. The equations work beautifully whichever direction you're going. But nevertheless, as a matter of observed reality, time only flows in one direction. And therefore, the change in CO2 that followed the change in temperature cannot have caused the change in temperature 
can it? Now, I'm not going so far as to say that just because it was that way round in the early climate, therefore it cannot be anything but that way round again. If we add lots of CO2 artificially to the atmosphere, and we are doing that, and it's probably uh, the most CO2 we've had in the atmosphere for the last 20 million years, and we've done that, that could cause some warming. I, I do not in any way deny that. The question is how much. But the point we're looking at here is whether or not Hansen's trick of saying, let's consider only greenhouse gas forcings and see if we can reproduce something like the temperature changes that were actually inferred from these ice cores. Is that a valid uh, reason for concluding? As the professor tries to conclude, it's extremely strong evidence that CO2 and the greenhouse effect is the biggest contributor to past climate change. Now, another reason why two data sets like this that appear to be correlated are not necessarily causative one of the other is that there could be a third cause which is causing both of them at the same time. For instance, there could be some major alteration in the solar system's characteristics which cause more sunlight to strike at a particular angle and cause the temperatures to change and then cause the CO2 to change. We don't know. And merely because the two data sets appear correlated, you cannot therefore tell that the reason for their correlation is not some outside factor that is causing both of them to change in the same way. So now I'm hoping you begin to understand why it is that in science, correlation of the kind that is so naively adopted here by Professor Abraham as though it must be true, does not necessarily imply that one of these two data sets caused the other, still less which caused the other, or even if either of them caused the other. Because there is a th another possibility, and that is that the correlation is entirely coincidental. That, too, is a possibility. It's not one I would push very hard in the present case, but it is a possibility. So I then show a slide which I think demonstrates in a slightly light-hearted way, and this is a slide I did show in my talk, which is why the point ought to have commended itself to Professor Abraham's mind, uh, that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. I've plotted here the number of Republican senators in the upper house of the Washington legislature against sunspot numbers. And there is a remarkably good and close correlation between the two. And indeed, in the last federal elections in 2008, there were virtually no sunspots on the sun. Very few Republican senators were elected. But now, the sunspots have come back in quite a good way. And I'm making this presentation just before the midterm elections. So if we follow my correlation here, we would expect to see that because there are more sunspots on the sun, we're going to get more uh, Republican senators. And there is an example of a correlation which I put it to almost certainly is purely coincidental. But it does show that you cannot assume that correlation between two, da two, two data sets implies a causative link between them. And therefore, the introduction of Hansen's paper, however intriguing, by Professor Abraham at this point, is nothing more than an elaborate and intellectually foolish red herring. Mm -hmm.